I already made three videos about the Garden of Eden and the four rivers that flowed out of it. These videos are titled, The Garden of Eden Was in the Black Sea, Biblical and Geological Proofs Provided, Gihon and Pison Rivers, and Havila, the Land of Gold Located, The Garden of Eden, the Book of Enoch, and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. In these videos, I showed how the Black Sea is where the Garden of Eden was located before it sunk, and how three Black Sea submarine canyons were the actual sources of three of the four rivers that came out of the Garden. And these submarine canyons are the Bosporus Submarine Canyon, which was the original source of the Nihon River, the Kisilermak Submarine Canyon, which was the original source of the Euphrates River, and the Nguri Submarine Canyon, which was the original source of the Pison River. Now, a submarine canyon is a steep-sided valley cut into the seabed of the continental slope having nearly vertical walls. Just as above sea level canyons serve as channels for the flow of water across land, submarine canyons serve as channels for the flow of turbidity currents across the seafloor. And an early and obvious theory of their formation was that the submarine canyons present today were carved during glacial times when sea level was about 125 meters below present sea level and that these submarine canyons used to be rivers flowing to the edge of the continental shelf. In this video, I will be showing you how another Black Sea submarine canyon named Chirok was the original source of the Hidekal River. I will also show you in this video why the Hidekal River was definitely the Tigris River as believed by many Bible scholars. The only information Genesis chapter 2 verse 14 gives us about the Hidekal is that it runs along the east side of Assur, which the King James Version mistakenly translated as Assyria. This mistake is critical because the Assyrian Empire was vast and covered a large territory with many cities whereas Assur or Ashur was just its capital city. And since the city of Assur is much smaller than the Assyrian Empire, one can pinpoint the location of the Hidekal more accurately by simply looking for a river that runs along the east side of Assyria's capital, Assur. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew word used for runs along is Haholek, having Strong's number H1980, that corresponds to the Hebrew root word halak. Looking at the Hebrew lexicon for this number, one can see that the Bible in Genesis chapter 5 verse 22 and 24 used the same Hebrew word in describing Enoch's walk or halak with God. It was also used in describing Noah's walk or halak with God in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 as well. And this kind of walk with God by people declared righteous by him implies closeness and special intimacy with God. In the same manner, Hidekal must have run along very near the east side of Assur, the capital city of Assyria. In fact, this river ran along so close to Assur that it actually defined the eastern border of that city. And this use of the Hebrew word halak to mean defining a border was in fact used in Genesis chapter 13 verse 17 when God instructed Abram to Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for to you I give it. Notice that in this verse, Abram was instructed not only to walk along the outside border of the land, but also to walk in the land throughout the entirety of its area. This implies that the Hidekal did not only define the eastern border of Assur, but the river must have been let inside the city in order to irrigate it and serve as the capital's main water source. And looking at a map of Assur provided by Wikipedia, one can see that the Assyrians did not even build an eastern wall for the inner city because 
the Tigris River already served for them as its defensive wall. Exploration of the site of Assur began in 1898 by German archaeologists, and unless their discovery and claim was a mistake, then the only river that served as the eastern border of Assur was the Tigris River. And this implies that the Tigris River was one and the same as the Hidekal River described in Genesis chapter 2 verse 14. There can be no valid argument against this. According to Strong's Hebrew lexicon, the word Hidekal occurred two times in two verses in the Hebrew concordance of the King James Version. And the second occurrence was in Daniel chapter 10 verse 4, which mentions Daniel being by the bank of the river Hidekal. However, if we put side by side the Hebrew interlinear for the two occurrences of this Hebrew word, one can see a difference in their nikud or vowel notations, where one is spelled Hidekel while the other Hidakel. Now some people argue that this difference means the river in Genesis chapter 2 verse 14 is not the same river as the one in Daniel chapter 10 verse 4. I emailed a rabbi about this, and this is the text of my message to him with incident ID 5149881. Genesis chapter 2 verse 14 mentions a river spelled Hidekel, and Daniel chapter 10 verse 4 mentions a river spelled Hidekel. Using Hebrew interlinear, one can see the difference in their Nikud notations. Some say they are the same river Tigris, while others say they are different rivers. If they are the same river Tigris, can you explain why the difference in spelling and Nikod notations between the two verses? The following is Chabad.org's Rabbi Elchanon Kaysen's reply to me with reference number 5149881. Is interested at times with if the cantillation on the word is either a soft pasuk or a snatcha. Thus, it is the same river and the pronunciation changes based on the cantillations. Wikipedia Hebrew cantillation purpose synagogue use. A primary purpose of the cantillation signs is to guide the chanting of the sacred text during public worship. Very roughly speaking, each word of text has a cantillation mark as its primary accent and associated with that mark is a musical phrase that tells how to sing that word. One can compare these cantillation marks to musical notes which are symbols that represent the pitch and duration of a sound. The rabbi mentioned the cantillations Sof Pasuk and Et Najta. Soft Pasuk is the cantillation mark that occurs on the last word of every verse in the Tanakh, while Et Najta marks the end of the first segment or sentence of a verse. In the case of Daniel chapter 10 verse 4, Hidakel is the last word of the verse, which is why it contains the Soft Pasuk cantillation. In the case of Genesis chapter 2 verse 14, Asur is the last word of the first segment or sentence of the verse, which is why it contains the Etnachta cantillation. Note that the word Hiddekel in Genesis chapter 2 verse 14 contains the Zakiaf Katan cantillation mark. And unlike the Sof Pasuk or the Etnachta, the Zagiaf Katan can appear anywhere in the verse any number of times. However, the rabbi in his email emphasized that the Kamat's vowel is interested or substituted at times only when the cantillation on the word is either a soft pasuk or et nachta. Otherwise, the original vowel, which in this case is the segol, should remain unreplaced. Thus, the hidekel in Genesis chapter 2 verse 14 minus the Zakiaf Katan cantillation mark and using an unreplaced Segol vowel represents the regular pronunciation of the word and which is why it is the one used in the Hebrew lexicon entry.
Thus, in summary, the Tomat's vowel can be substituted or interested if the cantillation of the word containing the Kamats is either the Sof Pasuk or the Etnachta. And this happens whenever the word is the last word of the verse or the last word of the first segment or sentence of the verse. Daniel was still in exile in Babylon in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, when he was by the side of the great river Hittekel, and the only river other than the Euphrates that is near enough to Babylon and occupied by King Cyrus was the Tigris River. And this is another solid argument why the Tigris is one and the same as the Hidekal River flowing out of the Garden of Eden. But since I claim that the Chirok submarine canyon in the Black Sea was the original source of the Hidekal, how do I connect the Tigris with the Chirok submarine canyon? The first connection between these two bodies of water will be the Lake Van. A scientific paper posted in ScienceDaily.com titled Poor Water Salinity, Key to Reconstructing 250,000 Years of Lake Van's History, was published on May 16, 2017. It is about the reconstruction of the huge lake level fluctuations that occurred over the past 250,000 years in Lake Van. One of its conclusions is that when the Lake Van was at its highest level, there must have been an outflow into the Tigris in the southwestern part of the basin. Now, the important question is when was the last time Lake Van was at its highest level and an outflow occurred into the Tigris? Wikipedia, Lake Van, prehistoric lake levels. The water level of the lake has often altered dramatically. Approximately 9,500 years ago, there was a dramatic drop to more than 300 meters or 980 feet below the present level. This was followed by an equally dramatic rise around 6,500 years ago. In one of my videos titled, What Year Was Adam Created and Which Years Are Sabbatical or Shmita Years? I came to the conclusion that Adam was created in the year 4000 BC, or exactly 6,019 years ago from the year 2020. Thus, if the traumatic rise of the water level of Lake Van around 6,500 years ago persisted for at least 500 years, then during the time of Adam and Eve, there must have been an outflow from Lake Van into the Tigris River. Strabo, a 1st century BC Greek geographer, mentioned in Book 11, Chapter 14, Paragraph 8 of his work, Geography, how the Tigris flows through Lake Van, which he called Lake Arsin or Topaitis. And I quote, There are also large lakes in Armenia, one to maintain, another is Arsin, also called Topaitis. The Tigris flows through this lake after issuing from the mountainous country near the Nephites. End of quote. According to Yusen, Ar Sashkun, the capital of the early kingdom of Urartu in the 9th century BC, was at the northeastern shore of Lake Van, now inundated by the waters of Lake Van. Ar Sashkun seems to be the Assyrian form of an Armenian name which recalls the name Arsin. Arsisa, applied by the ancients to part of Lake Van. Strabo also tells us that the Tigris issues from the mountainous country near the Nephites before flowing through Lake Van. John Milton, in Book 3 of his work, Paradise Lost, uses Mount Nephites as Satan's landing spot upon earth after his fall from grace in heaven. This happens before he tempted Adam and shortly after inquiring Uriel, the place of habitation of God's new creation, which is man, pretending a zealous desire to behold Adam. Satan landing first on Mount Nephites after inquiring Uriel, the place of habitation of Adam, implies that Adam was inhabiting Mount Nephites. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 to 14, 
there is mentioned a holy mount of God located in the Garden of Eden. This holy mountain must have been the dwelling place of Adam where Satan landed for the first time on earth and which John Milton named Mount Nephites. And I believe this mountain is located at the east side of the Garden of Eden, which according to Genesis chapter 3 verse 24, was where the Tree of Life is located. Looking at the map of the Black Sea, one can see that the Jarok Canyon, the source of the Hidekal River, is also located at the east side of the Garden of Eden. Thus my conclusion that the mountain of God mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 28 and which Strabo and John Milton called Nephites was the source of the Hidekal River flowing through the Chorok Canyon towards the Supsa River. Lake Van has an altitude of 1,640 meters or 5,380 feet. For the Hidekal River to climb up this very high altitude, the source of the Hidekal should have an altitude even higher. And this source, as I said earlier, was the mountain of God, whose altitude must have been considerably higher than that of Lake Van. The principle is the same as that used by modern aqueduct, which uses water pressure to transport water from a source whose altitude is higher than the altitude of its final destination. Along the path of these modern aqueducts, we can see water plunging deep and then climbing uphill, provided the altitude being climbed is lower than the altitude of the source. Because of friction and dispersion, water pressure is weakened along the way, and therefore, the altitude of the entire path should never be higher than the source until the water being transported reaches its final destination. This is because the lost pressure will prevent the water from climbing to an altitude as high as the source. And this is why underground tunnels used to transport the water are designed and constructed to minimize friction and dispersion. But in an open and exposed river, this ideal environment is not met, as we see river courses widening along the way causing dispersion and adverse weather and major blockages causing friction that lessens the momentum of the river current. However, in spite of this, we do see rivers climbing uphill, and one such river is the Mississippi River. Why the Mississippi River flows uphill? The Mississippi River, or any river flowing towards the equator, actually flows uphill. The Earth is not a perfect sphere. There is an equatorial ring about 13.5 miles high. In other words, sea level is not constant. It is higher at the equator than it is at the poles. In the case of the Mississippi, sea level at the mouth of the Mississippi is 6,373,159 meters from the center of the Earth. Sea level at the source of the Mississippi is 6,366,524 meters. Thus, the sea level is higher at the mouth than at the source. The difference is 4.12 miles. The source of the Mississippi, Lake Itasca, is 1,400 feet above sea level, and the mouth is by definition 0 feet above sea level. So we think of all that water flowing downhill 1,400 feet. But it is actually flowing against the force of gravity going 4 miles uphill. The force that keeps the water flowing is actually the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation. To understand how the centrifugal force works, let us look at the case of the Jarok Submarine Canyon, which is the source of the Hidekal River. As you can see, the centrifugal force can be broken down into its two component forces. One is the force that is anti-parallel to gravity and acts to oppose or weaken gravity. And the other is the force that is perpendicular to gravity and acts to accelerate the river's current along Earth's surface towards the equator. 
The anti-gravity component of the centrifugal force that weakens gravity pushes the tides upwards as gravity pulls it down. Thus, the stronger the anti-gravity component of the centrifugal force, the higher the vertical waves of a river current will rise. The component of the centrifugal force that is perpendicular to gravity on the other hand accelerates the current's momentum along Earth's surface towards the equator, thus continuously increasing its water pressure during its journey at a magnitude that can even be higher than the water pressure from its source. This explains why the Mississippi River or any river flowing towards the equator is able to climb uphill at an altitude higher than its source. And this also explains how the water coming from the mountain of God that falls down the sea level at the Chiroc Canyon was able to climb uphill towards Lake Juan, whose altitude is 1,640 meters or 5,380 feet. The effect of the centrifugal force can be likened to the effect the moon's gravity has on tides. The moon's motion as it rises from the east and sets in the west directs the tides to likewise follow its westward motion at an accelerated rate. This can be compared to the perpendicular component of the centrifugal force that directs the river current towards the equator also moving at an accelerated rate. And during a full moon, when it is directly overhead the tides, and during a supermoon, when it is closest to the tides, the moon's gravity produces its strongest, fastest, and highest tides. The same can be said of the centrifugal force, which is stronger near the equator than near the poles. And this explains the existence of equatorial waves, which are oceanic and atmospheric waves trapped close to the equator but can propagate in the longitudinal, east or west, and vertical directions, up and down. Note that the stronger the equatorial waves, the higher the tides will rise up vertically, and the stronger its longitudinal momentum, eastward or westward, will be. Wave trapping is the result of the Earth's rotation, or the centrifugal force this rotation creates. I believe that before the great flood of Noah's time, the Chiroc Submarine Canyon, or the source of the Hidekal River, was much nearer to the equator than it is now. Research shows that during the last 200 million years, a total true polar wonder of some 30 degrees has occurred. While these researchers do not believe on super rapid shifts in the Earth's pole, I instead believe that these 30 degrees pole shift happened instantly and quite catastrophically during the Great Flood of Noah's time. This 30 degrees pole shift was what caused the Great Pyramid, located at the equator or 0 degrees latitude before the Great Flood, to be located today at 29 degrees 58 minutes 45 seconds north. In my previous video titled, The Garden of Eden, The Book of Enoch, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I discussed how before the Great Flood, the Great Pyramid's apex was exactly at the equator, and its four corners were perfectly facing the four cardinal directions of the north, south, east, and west. This is why, according to the Book of Enoch, the Great Pyramid was used to divide the Earth into four hemispheres, namely the northern, southern, Western and Eastern Hemispheres. Note also how before the Great Flood, the Garden of Eden and therefore the Chiroc Canyon was about 30 degrees nearer at the equator at approximately 11 degrees 51 minutes 12.66 seconds north only compared to its current latitude of 41 degrees 49 minutes 57.66 seconds north. Thus, the centrifugal force before the Great Flood acting on the Hidekal River, starting from its source, the Chiroc Canyon, until the Lake Van, whose latitude was only 8 degrees, 41 minutes, 9.17 seconds north then, was a lot stronger than it is today. And this means 
the water pressure and the momentum of the Hidekel River's current as it flows from the Chirok Canyon up to the Lake Van must have been very strong in the past. And this is why Strabo, in Book 11, Chapter 14, Paragraph 8 of his work, Geography, describes the Tigris River in the following way, and I quote, The Tigris flows through this Lake Van after issuing from the mountainous country near the Nephites, and because of its swiftness, it keeps its current unmixed with the lake, whence the name Tigris, since the median word for arrow is Tigris. End of quote. Having said all this, let me now discuss the path taken by the Hidekel in the past, starting from Lake Van until it connects with the Tigris River. Wikipedia lists Lake Hazar as the main and only relevant source of the Tigris River. Looking at Google Map, we can see that the Tigris connects with Egil Barachi, which connects with Giralkisi Barachi, which connects to Lake Hazar through several small creeks. However, the Tigris River has other sources or tributaries, one of which originates very near the Lake Van. This tributary is the Botan River, also known as the Ulukai. The upstream or main source of the Botan River is often called Katak and is joined by the Boyukdir River at Pupurka. Meanwhile, downstream at the Botan River, it is also joined by two other rivers which are its other sources, and these are the Saravakai or River and the Bitlis, also known as the Basur Kai. Finally, at Katepi in Sirt province, the Botan or Ulukai joins the Tigris River. Now let us look at the map provided by Wikipedia to understand this better. Here is where the Katak, or the source of the Botan, is joined by the Buyukti River at Kukurka. Here is where the Botan River is joined by the Sarava River. And here is where the Botan River is joined by the Bitlis or Basur River. Note how the Bitlis River is located very near the Lake Van and I will be discussing this river in greater detail later on. Another river, the Keser or Pinarka Kai, is located near Lake Van, and it also connects with the Bitlis River. However, this river drains towards Lake Van and not towards the Tigris, and is therefore not one of the tributaries or sources of the Tigris. Now finally, here is where the Botan or Ulokai River joins the Tigris and thus becomes its other source or tributary other than Lake Hazar. The Ulokai River joins the Tigris at 37 degrees 43 minutes 39.2 seconds north and 41 degrees 46 minutes 41.5 seconds east. The Coxesu Stream joins the Ulokai at 37 degrees 48 minutes 37.7 seconds north and 41 degrees 50 minutes 7.4 seconds east. The Bitlis stream joins the Coxesu stream at 37 degrees 54 minutes 47.9 seconds north and 41 degrees 47 minutes 58 seconds east. Now according to Google map, the path of the Bitlis stream ends at 38 degrees 28 minutes 19.9 .9 seconds north and 42 degrees 11 minutes 30.8 seconds east. And if we look at its satellite image and then zoom out, we can see that the Bitlis stream ends very near the Lake Van already. Wikipedia refers to the Bitlis River as a tributary of the Tigris, and thus we have a tributary or source of the Tigris located very near the Lake Van. Now Strabo also said this about the Tigris and Lake Van, which he called Lake Arsene or Topitis. He said, and I quote, Near the recess of the Lake Van, the Tigris River falls into a pit, and after flowing underground for a considerable distance, rises near Chelonitis, end of quote. Chelonitis is probably the name of the enormous mountain where the Bitlis River starts its course very near its base. So far, Strabo has been very accurate in describing the Tigris as well as the Lake Van. 
he further stated two other facts about Lake Van, which are both confirmed by Wikipedia. Strabo said that Lake Arsene or Lake Van contains soda and that the fish in the lake are of one kind only. And according to Wikipedia, Lake Van is a saline soda lake and that the only fish known to live in the brackish water of Lake Van is the pearl mullet. Now going back to the Bitlis River, if we further zoom out and look at the Google map, we can see that the start of the Bitlis River is located near the southwest portion of Lake Van. And if you still recall the scientific paper posted in sciencedaily.com, it concluded that, and I quote, when the lake was at its highest level, there must have been an outflow into the Tigris in the southwestern part of the basin, end of quote. Now having established the path taken by the Hitekal River on its way from the Lake Van until it connects with the Tigris, let me now show you the path taken by the Hitekal starting from its source at the Chirok Canyon until it reaches the Lake Van. If we look at the map showing the Chirok Canyon and the Suksa River, and if we zoom in on this map, one can clearly see a submerged path connecting these two geologic points. The Chirok Canyon connects with the Supsa River at 42 degrees 1 minute 6.2 seconds north and 41 degrees 45 minutes 7.8 seconds east. The Supsa River connects with the Barra Mitsiskali at 41 degrees 56 minutes 52.5 seconds north and 42 degrees 27 minutes, 50.9 seconds east. The other end of the Baramitsitskali River, according to Google Map, is at 41 degrees, 50 minutes, 7.3 seconds north, and 42 degrees, 37 minutes, 40.3 seconds east. It also shows that this end of the Baramitsitskali River is near one end of the Gabvitskali River at 41 degrees, 49 minutes, 38.6 seconds north and 42 degrees, 37 minutes, 6.8 seconds east. If we now look at the satellite image of these two rivers, one can trace what could be a dried up path taken by the Baramitsitskali River to connect itself with the Gabvitskali River in the past, before the Great Flood. The Gabvitskali River connects with the Kivab Liani. The Kivab Liani connects with the Potskovitskali. The Potskovitskali connects with the Mitkivari. The Mitkivari connects with the Kura Neri. The Kura Neri connects with the Kara Stream at 41 degrees, 10 minutes, 42.4 seconds north, and 43 degrees, 5 minutes, 33.7 seconds east. And at 41 degrees, 7 minutes, 32.4 seconds north, and 43 degrees 16 minutes 9.6 seconds east of the Kara Stream, it comes close to Silder Golu at 41 degrees 6 minutes 16.7 seconds north and 43 degrees 15 minutes 51.7 seconds east with ground distance of only approximately 2.55 kilometers. Looking at the satellite image, one can trace a dried up path that could have connected these two bodies of water in the past. The Silder Golu connects with the Karsi stream. The Karsi stream connects with the Kars stream. The Kars stream connects with the Arpakai Barachi. The Arpakai Barachi connects with the Akurian River. The Akurian connects with the Aras River. And at 38 degrees 59 minutes, 39.3 seconds north and 45 degrees 26 minutes 57.8 seconds east of the Aras River's path, it connects with the dried up stream. I said this because if we zoom in at the satellite image and then look at its Google map, we can see that this dried up stream is not shown in the map. Now following the course of this dried up stream, it connects with an unnamed lake at 38 degrees 51 minutes 13.8 seconds north and 44 degrees 50 minutes 37.2 seconds east 
whose only identification is that it is located between Yuxari Korul and Dort Abhak. A dried up creek comes out of this unnamed lake that connects with the Sari Mehmet Marachi at 38 degrees 48 minutes 14.1 seconds north and 43 degrees 49 minutes 4.6 seconds east. The Karasu stream comes out of the Sari Mehmet Marachi at 38 degrees 47 minutes 34.4 seconds north and 43 degrees 44 minutes, 57.7 seconds east. And finally, following the Karasu Stream's path, we can see that it connects with the Lake Van at two points, one of which is at 38 degrees, 34 minutes, 57.1 seconds north, and 43 degrees, 13 minutes, 20.7 seconds east. If we now trace the course taken by the Hidekal using Google Bot, we can now see how the Hidekal must have looked like in the past. Note that the courses of some of the bodies of water I mentioned in defining Hidekal's path have reversed, which is why we see some of them moving northwards and draining at the Black Sea, instead of moving southwards towards the equator and originating from the Black Sea. And this is because the original source of the Hidekal, which was the Mountain of God located near the Chirok Canyon, has sunk after the Great Flood. The waters coming out of this mountain in the past had a tremendous momentum and water pressure pushing the course of the Hidekal southwards towards the equator. In my next video, I will give a scientific explanation as to why the Garden of Eden sunk under the Black Sea. Afterwards, I will be discussing the river that went out of Eden to water the garden. And by doing so, I will be giving the location of Eden and the land of Nod as well, where Cain built a city for his son named Enoch. I believe this city that Cain built was one and the same as the fabled cities of Atlantis and the Waraka, a city of gold built by Krishna according to the Hindus.